يا جماعة هنبدأ مع دكتور شادول علم ممكن يا جماعة كل الناس تقعد بليز للي عايزين يحضروا أنا أنصحكم تحضروا Yes please can everyone be seated and can we stay a bit silent please for the talk to start رنا 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 ممكن تقول لهم ما يتكلموش بليز الناحية دي اه الصوت And we have Rhonda Shaf. Here. Hina Fadia Rhonda, guys. Thank you, everyone. Let's be seated, please, because the time is, time is running. I want to greet you and thank you for coming this edition. Um, it has been a great, it has been a great value to have you and Maggie Stieber, and it, it's it's just it's a great pri privilege, really. And this was kept for you since the opening, since that you missed the opening. This was a little um, simple award from Cairo Photo Week. Thank you so much for your fascinating. Uh, it was a roller coaster to have you here, and I'm so uh, happy. And this is Act Two from our uh, three-act uh, series of talks. It's the great finale of Cairo Photo Week. Uh, I will uh, I will give the stage to uh, the mentor, the teacher, uh, the human rights activist, the iconic uh, Dr. Shaidul Alam, and of course uh, that that the Time Magazine Person of the Year 2018. Um, and I'm sure that everybody knows that already. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You will use this one? I'll use both. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. OK, well, thank you for staying the course. Uh, that was a great act to follow. Uh, so I hope I can live up to it. Thank you, of course, for Marwa. But putting something like this together is a lot of work, not just for Marwa, but for the entire team. So it, it's a huge amount of work. I would also like to thank the U.S. Embassy for supporting my visit here. But let's, let's get on with it. Um, I think I'll start with uh, a contradiction. Uh, I'm introduced as a photographer, which I do. I mean, I take pictures. But I see myself as a storyteller. I'm a storyteller who uses pictures. Uh, I use pictures because they work. If tomorrow photographs don't achieve what they're intended to be, I have no problems giving it up. I'm not married to photography. I will sing, I will dance, I do both very badly, but I will do that if needed. And I write, I write poetry, I, I do what I need to as I do. For me, it is what photography achieves rather than photography itself that is important. So we go with that. But as storytellers, we, you know, there is the usual format of how once upon a time, and then you go in a linear fashion. But not all stories go like that. Stories do not always have a beginning and an end and a middle in the same way. And uh, today is no different. So today, I received an email from um, a woman I, I didn't really remember, Mariam Khatab. Um, I was, you're there? OK, this, she's at the back. Yeah. Well, she wrote um, an email to me this morning. Uh, day before yesterday, I was giving a talk at Sunderland University, where I'm a professor. And at the end of the day, she asked questions. And then, through this letter, that she had actually interviewed me earlier on, which gave her the, I think it was, um, 
what, the feature writer, best feature writer of the year in the UK. So congratulations on that. And this was a piece which I didn't know about before. So how this world gets connected is very, very interesting. There's someone in Cairo meeting up in an online platform for Sunderland University, and there she is at the back. But I'll digress because I want to use that opportunity to tell you a little bit about the other side of the story. So let's move on to that. Um, let's hope this works. Uh, I'm a photographer, a writer, a curator based in Bangladesh. I've been working largely as a human rights activist for the last 20, 30 years. I look at the society I live in, um, the and one of the things that's been my passion for a long time is to address some of those inequalities. The police specifically asked for from these armed goons to combat unarmed students demanding safe roads. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Today, I was in the streets. There are people with machetes in, in their hands chasing unarmed students, and the police are standing by watching it happen. There is corruption everywhere in the world, um, but in our part of the world, we, we can afford corruption the least. So that was a massive campaign that had taken place. And I say this because I want to put the whole thing into, co into context. I take pictures. But the reason I take pictures is because I think pictures work. They're so powerful. They are capable of bringing about change. But it is the change that I'm after, not the pictures itself. Sure, I like to take a good picture like anyone else. But to me, that's not the point of the exercise. And a decision that I made quite early was that in order to be effective, I needed to do more than taking pictures. And one of the decisions I made was to build institutions, to build structures which would be part of that campaign. If I'm fighting a fight, I need weapons, I need warriors, and part of that structure involved building institutions. And the way I decided at that time I would fight this fight was to not go into politics mainstream, because in my country, Politics, as in many other countries, is largely about money and muscle. And I felt if that was the mechanism through which I entered politics, I would be no different from the others. I had to have a different campaign. So I chose three areas of intervention, media, education, and culture. And on, those three, on that tripod, I was going to exert pressure upon the political space so politicians could not get what they get away with. Um, so I'll go back a little bit. Um, this I'm is. I'm a photographer, oops, a writer. Uh, that's this is the one I wanted. So this, the words say "shadhinota," which is Bangla for independence. This is shortly before our war of liberation in 1971, and it was there was genocide. There was a very brutal war, but we eventually won. And these are some of the leading artists of my country. This is not a photograph by me. This is by a very famous photojournalist, Roshit Talukdar, who, who's, uh, whose work is in our archives. Um, and again, to come back to what I was saying, media, education, culture, I set up a media institution, DRIC, an agency, a school of photography, Pachala, and later a festival of photography like you have today. And the three together uh, are part of that structure. So these were people, artists, leading intellectuals, writers, artists, in the street resisting. And that was very important for us. That resistance made a lot of difference. And today, I think in many of our countries, including perhaps here, my problem is not so much that tyrants and autocrats are repressive. They all are across the globe. My problem is that people like you and me today are silent. The people who were in the streets today are silent. And I believe it is our to get away with what they get away with. So we are culpable. And I think we need to remind ourselves of that. So the war was towards its end. Um, we became independent on the 16th of December. The military knew before that that they were going to lose. 
So what they decided to do was to basically invite the leading thinkers of my country on the 14th of December. We became the independent 16th. On the 17th of December, this is a photograph taken by Roshi Talukdar, the same photographer. The retreat, the army that was going to lose, one crippled the country intellectually before it left. And this was the way through which they were doing it. We became independent. Uh, I, I left the country, I went free. I came back to find that a military general. And that is again one of the issues I want to bring up. I mean, we often suffer from the fallacy that an election automatically produces democracy. It never does. The democratic process needs far more than that, even if the election is genuine. In most cases, elections are not. So our elections were staged, they were not. Uh, I'll move on a little bit because uh, this is a news item that Al Jazeera did about our military, which the government banned and it, you couldn't see it. But what is very interesting for me is that earlier last month, end of last month, Al Jazeera did a major expose on the head of our military, the fact that he had convicted murderers as his brothers who were fugitives, and he was actually helping them by giving them false identity, helping them get military contracts, and they came over to, you know, to weddings. These were people who were the top terrorists of the country, being essentially supported by the government itself. Interestingly, you know, that's a story that would have been in every headline normally. Not a single media covered it. It was on television, it was not on radio. It was a program called the All the Prime Minister's Men, very important program, but it wasn't there. No one spoke about it. The government gave out uh, a rejoinder to the program. And this was quite interesting. The media utilized the rejoinder to talk about the program itself. And some intelligent editors actually talked about the story that they did not publish. And through that, were able to discuss this very, very important story uh, about our country. But they, of course, had, had issues. They had to work their way out. Now, we're talking of this. Uh, you know, Egypt is, has perhaps similar situations. To give, get an idea from you, if the most wealthy country in the world would be one and the poorest would be ten, where do you think Bangladesh would be? The wealthiest is one. Nine. So, yeah. Anyone else with ideas? Something around that, perhaps. We would think that Bangladesh would be low down there somewhere. It's true. However, there is an index indicator called ultra-high net worth. These are people who have assets worth over $30 million each. And Bangladesh has the highest growth rate of ultra-high net worth people. One of the poorest countries in the world with the fastest growing rate of wealthy people. This is not unusual. It happens in many countries. And that's one of the things we need to decipher. But I will now go towards the festival that we do. I, you understand uh, this, the media agency because we created a platform for local storytellers. The school, we needed warriors, so the school was there to train people. But we also wanted to intervene at a cultural level. Now, I was arrested on the 5th of August 2018 because of what I said, the interview I gave to Al Jazeera. I came out on bail. There was a massive international campaign. I came out on bail on the 20th of November. Our festival was in the first week of February. So we took the decision, and it takes a lot of time to plan for a festival. So we decided we would go ahead with the festival while in jail. Before we knew whether or, if or when I would come out, we decided we'd go ahead. We knew we would have no sponsors because the sponsors would be terrified of being associated with us. We decided to go ahead. And I'm going to show you a little clip made by uh, about the festival itself because I think it's relevant to what we're talking about. 
This was in February 2019, shortly after the government has won rigged election where they have won 98% of the seats in some of the centers. They've won 100% of the votes. Most of the votes were cast the day before. It's a complete spectrum takeover. I had the most powerful weapon in my hands. You know, the police had sticks, they had guns, but I had a camera. With that, I could do far more than they could. These are all parts of the festival. That was work where it's... No heaven, no to hell, okay, I'll show no ever after. Do I care for when I'm gone? Peace here I seek, in the sand and soil. This place where I was born. This is a city that has amazing history and tradition that goes back a long, long way. When you look at colonial history, when you look at the transformations that have taken place, and at least in the subcontinent, colonial history it has pretty much run parallel with photographic history. You know, uh, the Farish statements about influence in people's minds uh, refer to controlling the natives. But in fact, photography has been used to control people's minds and continue um, to be used by countries, powers, forces to shape our minds. We desire things, we want to things based on how people present a certain world to us. And if one is to deconstruct that world, it will be a wider area. In I'm not sure what's happening. Um, I, I will not dwell on that. Uh, I'll talk about it. So the festival had become very important. It had gained stature, and at one stage we decided we would invite the president to open our festival. And he agreed. Um, so we knew the president is coming. That has a lot of nightmares, security hazards, and all sorts of things that happen along with it. But we felt, okay, Chobimala, the festival has come to a certain maturity. The president coming is a good thing. There is one advantage of getting the president to come, because then you get to write the president's speech. And if you're smart, you can get him to say things you want him to say. They're not really very good at this, so um, they'll go along with it. So the president actually reads out the speech. Shortly, this is 2015, and Israel had been attacking Gaza. Uh, uh, officials. Oh, it's coming about back again. This world that we live in, which is so image-dominated, all activists, documentarians are all using this medium to influence our minds. But the other word, festival, is very intrinsic to Bangla culture. We have festivals pretty much every day on something, somewhere, and we love to celebrate. The joy of celebrating life we take to um, There is always a technical hitch. So I'll, I'll carry on. We'll improvise, as one does. Um, so we have the president coming. So one of the things I did was I put on the kafir, the Palestinian scarf, because I wanted to protest. I knew all the cameras would be on us, so this was an opportunity. And here we have, uh, if, if this moves, let's see if it works. At the moment it seems stuck. I did test it out. I mean, this is invariably what happens at any technical event. Um, do we have a technical person to help out? If you don't, we'll carry on. We, we, we've avoided it. So that's the president of Bangladesh with what is now perhaps the biggest enemy of the state as far as the state is concerned. Um, let's come back to it. Now it's gone too far. Uh, there, um, but I'm not going to dwell on that. Made It's now gone too far. This is a guessing game. Uh, let's see, maybe I just shut up for a bit and see, let it quieten down. It's, it's worried about me. Yeah? Yeah? Okay, so I'm, I'm going to show you, oh, what's happening here? No, I don't want to first quit. Okay, we'll, we'll try it. We keep... Someone is... 
Well, we're here. Okay, while that someone is, could you, could you have a look to see what's happening? And while that's happening, I'll move on to another story that I'm doing. One of the things that had happened very early on, when I did my seminal work on the resistance to General Ishad, it, it was almost impossible. I mean, we didn't own galleries and we couldn't show work. So we were trying to show this work. And of course, we got turned down everywhere. But when we did eventually show the work, we had in three and a half days, something like 400,000 people came to see the show. We had near riots, a queue over a mile long because people were so hungry for this imagery. But something else happened, which was very interesting. My show got turned down largely because it was very critical of the regime of a particular minister and the show was reviewed by a magazine which was owned by the minister's wife. And I thought, that's unusual. What's going on here? And I looked at the review. It was a beautiful review. It talked about the artistry of my work, the quality of my prints, the aesthetic, and all that sort of thing, totally ignoring the politics of the story. And I thought, OK, I know how this game is played. So you'll give me a little award, you'll give me a grant, you'll say nice things about me, and I can stay quiet about the politics, and that's fine. But, but so that was when I decided I would not allow my, the politics of my work to be separated from my art. So I would produce artwork such that my politics was embedded within the artwork itself. You could not separate them. So that was, that's roughly what I'm going to try and show once yeah, okay, can we show this? Uh, from the beginning of this video. Yeah. So, what is happening here is these are straw mats. A woman called Kolpana Chakma was abducted by the military. She's the head of the Indigenous Women's Association. Um, and I'll go along with it. We've lost some time. So, what's when I visited the home, I discovered that they had almost no furniture. All they had were these straw mats. So I decided the straw mats would be my canvas. I spoke to her brother, and they said that her abductor, a military lieutenant, they had an argument because the military had burned their villages. So I decided I would use fire to produce the imagery. I was also very involved with the garment industry, where a lot of the human rights abuses take place. So I took a laser device. I mean, you have, will have seen, you have people, you're wearing jeans with torn jeans. Now, those torn jeans are not accidental. There's a designer who designs the tear, and these laser devices burn according to the design, and when you wash them, you get random uh, jeans like that. So I adapted, and let me just stop briefly, so basically, I took this device, which was designed for the garment industry, and I used the fire from the laser device to burn these straw mats. And that's what you saw happening at the beginning. It's a technique I developed. So when you look at that work, and currently it's showing uh, at the Asia Society in Houston, there is no way you can ignore the politics behind it. So when we showed the work in Bangladesh, as you enter the gallery, it's dark. You first smell the burnt grass. And then it's performative. One by one, the light candles are lit. And this was about the people who've been fighting for Kolpona. And at the moment, what is happening is a poem written in indigenous language is being read, read out in local language, in English. And the audience chants it along with it. So it's very performative. And it became a very, very... Uh, impressive, whoops, we should go back, can we? Uh, now, I was in presenter mode, and that seems to have gone. Let me try that again, see if that works. Sorry about this, we're improvising quite a lot, as we always need to do. Uh, uh, where are we? Show presenter mode? Are we there? I don't see presenter mode. No? Uh, uh, any help from anyone? 
Okay, I, I'll just go to the right slide on here and then we'll go from there. Okay, so um, this is what I was showing you. And essentially, this was a very, very powerful experience. So people were in tears in the gallery. But then we go on to... Uh, yeah, I, I was showing it in presenter mode, but it doesn't seem to be going there anymore. That's keynote, not the... Ah, okay. But we have an option. If you don't, don't worry. Don't worry. I'll, I'll go with keynote. It's okay. It's okay. okay. We improvise. That's no problem. You sing, we dance, we do want what we need to. So it's not an issue. Let's move further forward. Um, this, this picture. Uh, okay. I'll just move forward. Yeah. Uh, I'll show you this briefly because this is how the print is being made. It's actually a straw mat that is burned by a laser device to produce this imagery. But I'll go on because I talked about this before. Is this going to be is that the owner closes the gate. So when there was a fire, people couldn't come out and they got burnt. So I was not in the country at that time. So people could run out of the building. Outside, we have this and we're performing. So they, they don't know what the hell's going on. They've come out of their building because all these people are crying and wailing. They come out, there's a performance, there's this. And of course they respond. It's a, owners, the, the MPs, the parliamentarians are mostly business people. So uh, the garment industry has a lot to do with the, the elected parliamentarians. So they write the, write the laws. So obviously they're very powerful. So the police come and whatever. Now, while I've been saying all this, you might get the impression that I'm, I'm saying my government does appreciate art. That's not true at all. They appreciate art far more than you think. So we like to get an audience in, in when we have a show. We like to get a response. When I had this show, this is the response I got. I mean, you can hardly see the government ignoring me. Yeah? I mean, how often have you had a photographic exhibition when you're at reception like this? You know, it's tremendous. Um, so, you know, I, I want to, don't get, want to give you those impressions about my government. But let's move on to something else. Let's hope this one works. Uh, this was, uh, I later won the Lucy Award, but I couldn't go because I was in jail. Uh, and they put together this video, but I'm showing it because it gives you a little bit of context about the political structure in Bangladesh. The foot his body where his mouth is for his whole life, and that is remarkable. He's been a leader in photojournalism for decades. His work in Bangladesh has hugely changed the perception of Bangladesh. He has a vision. He wants the world to change. He hates injustice. In all his work, all his practice, he's introducing his, his philosophy, his way of thinking. One of the things with Shahidul that makes him singular is he is so international. He literally transcends boundaries. He's a citizen of the world, for sure. The way I found him to be primarily is as a mentor and teacher. He brings people together. He shares his knowledge, the knowledge of others. He cares deeply about mentoring younger photographers, photo editors, curators, and he's an activist. There is a world-class standard of what a humanitarian is, and I think that Chaidul matches that, almost defines it. Here's a man born of privilege who could have gone anywhere in the world to be whatever he wanted to be, but he chose to stay in Bangladesh. And not only to be a photographer in Bangladesh, but to help build up an entire photography community. Shahid Alam set up Drake in 1989, and so by setting up Drake, it brought under one roof an amazing visual archive. When he develops his Biennale festival, Chubby Mela, he put that festival for one good reason, so that people in Bangladesh could come and see photography they would never see otherwise. The kind of photographers he has trained to become the kind of image makers of the future has also changed the way we view South Asia, the way we view Bangladesh, the way we also join the bigger dots of, of the bigger story through image making itself. I think he's very motivated by creating a place for Bangladesh on the world stage in terms of photography and storytelling. 
and he's also very motivated by Bangladesh being able to sustain itself. Chaiduo is fierce in his absolute commitment to justice and to uncovering problems that need to be uncovered. None of this is cost free. Shahid all knows that what he's doing is making enemies. He is in Bangladesh one of the voices of reason, a very articulate voice, and that is probably the reason that he is in jail right now. Having him in jail is not only silencing him, taking his voice away, but it's instilling fear amongst these younger photographers, these younger journalists uh, that he has nurtured over the years. The inspiration that he brings is real. For anybody who cares about justice, for anybody who cares about what's happening in this world, Chai's actions and his words are going to be seen important. Because it's not just about Chai um, it's about journalism and freedom of speech and freedom of expression and freedom of information around the world. He's one of the born with a deep commitment to trying to make the world a better place. Okay, let's see if it works now. Okay. So what happened was, yeah, yeah? yeah. it's okay. Well, anyway, um, so now I, I need to give you a little bit of background here. Uh, I'm arrested on the 5th of August, 2018. Prior to that, Professor Yunus, Muhammad Yunus, our Nobel laureate, the best known Bangladeshi, friend of the Clintons, whatever, the government go after him and get away with it. Jail, we think that hell's gonna break loose, they get away the chief sent on exile. Here's a pesky journalist, we can deal with this. Suddenly, the entire world explodes. And there were people in Egypt, there were people all over the world who campaigned, and it just became incredible. What they did includes, at that time, the Prime Minister was speaking at the UN in New York, so they flew a plane around the UN building, so she couldn't avoid, uh, you know, that says, free our teacher, or something like that. Uh, and. You know, I don't know all the people here, but I do know some of them. But I was mentioning to um, a friend earlier on, Richard Branson. I mean, I have no connection with Richard Branson. Why the hell he would be campaigning for my release, I don't know. You know, uh, and so many of the people, I'm very grateful to them. But the fact is that really a, a, an incredible community across the globe became involved in, in doing this because we'd been able to build a community. It was not simply photography, it was not simply the activism, it was how we'd reached out in a way that mattered to people, we felt. But, I, and that's the we do thing as well. What had happened was, in when I first exhibit, I invited my friends, my clients, to come to the show, as one does, I also invited all the friends. I mean, at that time, I was doing corporate work, so I invited all the CEOs and whatever, but I also invited the janitors and the guards and everyone else. They were my friends, and I gave them invitations. No one came to the show. So I said, well, what's the matter? And they said, would they have let us in? And I don't know if it's the same in every country, but certainly in my country, you can just be looking at a person, tell whether they're or not, and you know, by the way they hold themselves, by the way they speak. And probably a guard at the gallery would have thought it was a job to stop these other people from getting in. And if they did get in, you and I would look at them in such a way that they would know that they did not belong. So I decided, okay, if the people cannot go to the gallery, the gallery must go to the people. So we started designing shows on boats that went along rivers, on bullock carts, on rickshaw vans, on tuk-tuks, anywhere. So they went to football fields, to school playgrounds, whatever. And we insisted that our work would, you know, a white cube would not be blocking out the public. We would turn it around. So that's one of the things we did. And then in the last show, 
we'd invited Arundhati Roy. So we actually quite early on decided to do things which, uh, which we worked at many levels. One of the things was, and I will show you a picture later, we introduced email to Bangladesh in the early 90s because we knew we, if we had to fight, we have to fight uh, a battle we can win. We didn't have international telephone lines. We didn't have fax machines. So we started email using FidoNet technology, linking up South Latin America, Africa, other countries in Asia to begin our, our resistance. We, in our first festival many years ago, we invited Noam Chomsky to do a video conference way before any of the Western agencies, Western festivals had started doing video conferencing. In our most recent one, we invited the Indian writer Arundhati Roy. And she's a big name, so she is who she is. The government canceled the booking the day before. And you know, you can't get a thousand seater gallery just like that, you know, space just like that. And that was what the government had calculated. We've allowed her to come, we've given her a visa. Sorry, we don't have a place. So we're looking for a place, and the spaces are scared because they don't want to give us the space. Um, we found a place, and the way to get it was through my jail contacts. Now, I'm not recommending interviewed every day. I met tremendous people, made extremely good contacts, and they said, for you, anything. So we had this, uh, Arundhati and I had this conversation in this place that my jail, ex-jailmates arranged for me, and... It was, you know, it started late, people sat on the floor, over a thousand people, all that sort of thing, great stuff. Then, the Prime Minister sent an emissary to say she would like a few minutes with Arundhati Roy, if possible. Yeah? And Arundhati is a cool cat. She says, yeah, sure, I've met Prime Ministers before, I'm happy to meet you, but I'm here as Shahidul's guest, so if the two of us come, I'll be happy to come. So then they, the invitation is retracted, maybe some other time. So I'm giving you a sense of how we operate in these spaces. It's certainly not linear. The other thing that happens is that generally you invite ministers or big people because otherwise the media don't cover it. The only time the media covers it is if you have top-level VIPs. We never invite those people and get better media coverage than anyone else ever does. And Actually, we've talked a lot about what it takes to become photographers and things like that, and how things are dangerous, how we have to work in different For your work to be so bloody good that they cannot ignore you. Your work to be so bloody good that it has to be recognized. And that if your work is of that caliber, they're the ones who want to come onto the stage beside you, because you've created that space. I'm, we, we've talked about this and many of those situations. I'm just going to go back into the type of photography and what local photographers can do and cannot do. In my country, today it's changed a little bit, but usually women break bricks, break, and that's how you make buildings. And I've seen so many pictures of brick breakers. This is by an GMB Akash, a first-year student of my school many years ago. He's now quite a well-known photographer. But what Akash does is rather than photograph the woman breaking bricks, he knows that when she has a break, she expects another woman to bring her little baby so she can steal a kiss. That is the story of a brick-breaking person. It is Brick-breaking is a valid story. Uh, but you can tell the story in many ways. So this is a local photographer who has identified another aspect of the story through which it can be told. Islamophobia is a big deal across the world today. Uh, one of the things very interesting about Islam is that you do not need a mosque. You do not need a priest. You can have an immediate connection with God. Yeah? And this photograph by Hassan Saifuddin Chondon is about a man who, during when it comes up to time for prayer, puts down his cart and he prays. There is a very interesting African saying that until the lions find their storytellers, stories about hunting will always glorify the hunter. That is always the case. Cologne has done that, continue to do it. So we need to find our own storytellers. We need to become our own storytellers. This is 
change is it's not quite in sequence. This is my mum and dad. My dad teaching my mum that the computer doesn't bite. Uh, but this is shortly after we'd introduced email to Bangladesh. And it was because we had email at such an early stage that we were able to overcome a lot of the technical limitations that we had. So we, we've used every tool in the book. Again, when we started working with people, um, we found the people who the work was about very rarely got to see work. It went to a white cube gallery. They were forgotten. So when we did the work, we took the show back to the village, set it up under a and before the show opens, you've got all the kids around. Some have gone up. The foot. I noticed there's a little kid, and she's badgering everyone. And I was curious, what's, what's so important about why does this have to come into the show? So I come down, and I, I sort of talk to the kid. And she said, yeah, I've got to see the show. Why? Because my goat has to see the show. Why? Because he's in the exhibit. Now, as you can see, the goat's not really very interested in that exhibit, you know, that picture. But for this little girl, it's very important that her goat in this exhibit has to go and see the show and has to be the first one to see it. Now, if we had an essay about the goat, if we had the song about the goat or a poem about the goat, I'm not convinced that she would have been dragging her goat to see it. But if it's a photographic exhibition, the goat has to see it. And that is the power of this medium of ours. The fact that it can relate not only to everyone, but to people to such an extent that this little girl believes it relates to her goat as well. And I think that is something we often forget, uh, what our medium can do. This is a different story. I, we bring out calendars. And calendars in most countries are about pretty women, about in my country about mosques or flowers or nature or things like that. We began to use the calendar itself as a means of social messaging. And calendar was this picture of about the wedding of the minister, which for which my show had been uh, cancelled, uh, for which there was a review. So I'm flying to Britain at one stage to London. Uh, he goes, "You don't recognise me, do you?" I said, "No." I'm that fat girl in that picture in the calendar. Oh. Now, what had happened was, this is the minister's home, and I'm photographing rich kids watching TV. I've also got another picture, I don't have the time to show it now, which looks at subaltern, how they watch TV. But this girl was initially very excited about the fact that her picture was in a calendar. But as she grew, she recognized this as calendar is a critique of her life and the life of the well-to-do. And she was saying that that picture made her decide she would give up corporate life and take on work as a social worker. And on that flight, she was going to Sierra Leone to work in a large NGO called BRAC as a social worker. And she said, that's what that photograph did for me. So often we don't know, and we don't do massive things perhaps, but we do sometimes make a change to some people's lives, and that's enough. So, when we did the festival, uh, as I say, I came out on the 20th of November uh, 2018. We had the festival in 2019, February. And by then, the government had complete clean sweep of the election. They controlled the police, they controlled the military, they controlled the judiciary and the bureaucracy. So all of that was under control. In our festival, the first event was a discussion about freedom of thought and expression in South Asia. And we bought, gr bought the greatest thinkers of South Asia to talk about that. And what happened as a result was very interesting. Our festival earlier on had been largely attended by photographers or photo photography lovers or artists. Then we started getting contacted by trade unionists, uh, small groups, whatever, workers, people, all sorts of things, because they said, if an art event is capable of showing that defiance, we need to learn from it. It's no longer just an art event. It's resistance at a very uh, basic form, and that has to be what we build upon. So that now, the festival that we have, has become much more than an art event. It is 
something that gives hope to people who believe that through that festival they can resist. Um, this is, I'm going to, I'm towards the end, I know we've gone on. This is a picture, and today I, I'm talking about a letter that I got earlier, but today a friend of mine sent me another letter to say that the ruling government, it's coming up to the 50th anniversary of Bangladesh on the 26th of March. They're having a huge gala event. And this picture is a backdrop. They've stolen this picture of mine, used it as a backdrop. The very person they put in jail because of dissent, they're using this picture in there. But there is a more interesting story to go with that. And that is, while I was in jail, I was in hospital. And the prisoners took extremely good care of me. They, we don't, no one messes with this guy, you know, so I was, and they came into the hospital, met me, say, we want one of your photographs. And I managed to smuggle in my book with this picture inside. So when I come out of jail, when I come out of hospital, I'm still in jail, on the wall of the hospital, this 12 foot mural that my fellow prisoners have painted in my honor. And that's still there in jail. So we get things published, we are very happy, we can win awards. For me, this is the greatest award I could ever have, my fellow prisoners, uh, in terms of what they've done for me. And I'll end with this image because I'm known in professional circles, you know, as a photographer, as a journalist, but the average person didn't know me. The local rickshaw wallah didn't know me. Uh, after I come out, I've I've come out of our office, and there's a woman uh, waiting. She has a young baby, a newborn baby with her. And she's obviously been waiting for some time. And she comes up to me and says, I want you to bless my child. I want him to grow up to be as brave as you. And, you know, we are mostly middle class, upper middle class, well-to-do people. We don't take risks. We take our, tell our children, stay out of it. It's not your problem. We'll send you to the United States. You'll go to a good school. Why get into the trouble? But the subaltern of my country have not sold out. They're the ones who still believe. And this woman still takes risks. In meeting me, she's taking a risk. But that is what she wants her child to be. And that is something we must not forget. And I leave you with this picture because these are artists protesting in the streets of Dhaka when it is extremely dangerous to do so. When people, I, I've met people in jail who, who are in jail because they've shared my Facebook post. Uh, I've been tortured. There are many others who've been tortured. Right now we're campaigning because a, recent, a writer recently died in jail and a cartoonist was severely tortured. So we, those are the things we're fighting in. But despite that, there are people who are out there in the streets and they continue to fight the fight. And I will leave you with that because I think while we blame it on governments, we blame it on other things, at the end of the day, the responsibility is ours. And if you and I have not done our bit, in some sense, we are culpable for the situation we are in. Thank you very much. Yeah, they happen. We survive. Yeah? Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Tell you to stay, you're going to suffer. You've been through Maggie, you've been through me. We're inviting you to suffer again. So Maggie and I will we'll be on board, and Marwa will join us, I hope. Exactly. We won't do the talking anymore.